So for the record, the jury is present. As I promised you yesterday, I made a copy of jury instructions for you. It's that packet on top of your jury notebooks. You're welcome to flip that over at this time. All I would ask you to do is to not um, read ahead of me. Don't fall behind me. Simply read along with me. I think you'll get more out of the instructions if we have that process, okay? Does everybody have their copy? Great. So dispensing with the cover page, instruction number one of page one of two, members of the jury, the evidence in this case has been completed. In a moment, I'll read you the law which you must apply in order to reach your verdict. But first, I want to mention a few things that you need to keep in mind when you are discussing this case in the jury room. It is the court's responsibility to decide what rules of law apply to the case. While the lawyers may have commented during the trial on some of these rules, you are to be guided by what I say about them. You must follow all of the rules as I explain them to you. Even if you disagree or don't understand the reasons for some of these rules, you must follow them. No single rule describes all the law which must be applied. Therefore, the rules must be considered together as a whole. During the course of the trial, you received all of the evidence that you may properly consider to decide the case. Your decision must be made by applying the rules of law which I give to you to the evidence presented at trial. Neither sympathy nor prejudice should influence your decision. If you decide that the prosecution has proved beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant has committed the crimes as charged, it will be the court's responsibility to decide what the punishment will be. You should not try to guess what the punishment might be. It should not enter into your consideration at any time. At times during the trial, lawyers made objections to questions asked by other lawyers and to answers by witnesses. Do not draw any conclusions from such objections or from my rulings on the objections. These only related to the legal questions that I had to determine and should not influence your thinking. When I told you not to consider a particular statement, you were told to put that statement out of your mind and you may not consider any statement in your deliberations which, were, which you were instructed to disregard. Page two of two of instruction one. Sometimes in the trial, I may have asked questions of witnesses. When I ask questions, that did not indicate I had an opinion about the facts in the case. Finally, you should consider all of the evidence in the light of your observations and experience in life. Instruction number two. The information in this case charges that the defendant, Alan Andrade, on or about July 16th and 17th, 2008, in the county of Wells, state of Colorado, did commit the crime crimes of first degree murder, bias motivated crime, and aggravated motor vehicle theft in the first degree. The information in this case also charges that the defendant, Alan Andrade, on or between July 17th, 2008, and July 28th, 2008, in the County of Wells, State of Colorado, did commit the crime of identity theft. Mr. Andrade has entered a plea of not guilty to all charges. The information filed against Mr. Andrade is not evidence. Instruction three, the evidence in this case consists of the sworn testimony of all of the witnesses and all exhibits which you have received in evidence. You are to consider only the evidence in this case and reasonable inferences therefrom. An inference is a deduction or conclusion which reason and common sense uh, led the jury to draw from facts which have been proved. Instruction number four. Every person charged with a crime is presumed innocent. This presumption of innocence remains with the defendant throughout the trial and should be given effect by you unless, after considering all of the evidence, you are then convinced that the defendant is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. The burden of proof is upon the prosecution to prove to the satisfaction of the jury beyond a reasonable doubt the existence of all of the elements necessary to constitute the crime charged. Reasonable doubt means a doubt based upon reason and common sense, which arises from a fair and rational consideration of all of the evidence or lack of evidence in the case. It is a doubt which is not a vague, speculative, or imaginary doubt, but such a doubt as would cause reasonable people to hesitate to act in matters of importance to themselves. 
As to each count, if you find from the evidence that each and every element has been proven beyond a reasonable doubt, you should find the defendant guilty as to that count. If you find from the evidence that the prosecution has failed to prove any one or more of the elements beyond a reasonable doubt, you should find the defendant not guilty as to that count. Instruction number five. You may have to decide what testimony to believe. You should carefully consider all of the testimony given and the circumstances under which each witness has testified. Consider each witness's knowledge, motive, state of mind, demeanor, and manner while on the stand. Consider the witness's means of knowledge, ability to observe, and strength of memory. Consider also any relationship each witness may have to either side of the case, the manner in which each witness might be affected by the verdict, and the extent to which, if at all, each witness is either supported or contradicted by other evidence in the case. You should consider all facts and circumstances shown by the evidence which affects the credibility of the witness's testimony. You may believe all of the testimony of a witness, or part of it, or none of it. Instruction number six. There are two types of evidence from which you may properly find the truth as to the facts of a case. One is direct evidence. The other is circumstantial evidence. That is, the proof of facts from which other facts may reasonably be inferred. The law makes no distinction between direct and circumstantial evidence. Instruction number seven. The defendant is never compelled to testify, and the fact that he does not cannot be used as an inference of guilt and should not prejudice him in any way. Instruction number eight. The mere number of witnesses testifying for or against a certain point does not necessarily prove or disprove that point. Instruction number nine. Although out-of-court statements of the defendant have been admitted into evidence, it is the sole prerogative of the jury to determine what weight, if any, is to be given the out-of-court statements and any testimony directly related to the statements. Instruction number 10. During the trial, a witness was assisted by a Spanish language court interpreter. You are to draw no inferences from from nor consider in any way the use of this interpreter. If you are able to understand the Spanish language and you are able to hear any of the translation being provided, you are to disregard anything you heard said in the Spanish language by the court interpreter or the witness and you may consider only that which has been presented in the English language even if you believe the translation to be inaccurate. <clears throat> Instruction number 11. You have heard testimony from persons who have testified as expert witnesses. You are not bound by the testimony of an expert witness and the person's testimony is to be weighed as that of any other witness. It is entirely your decision to determine what weight shall be given to the testimony of each and every witness, including expert witnesses. Instruction number 11, excuse me, 12. In this case, a separate offense is charged against the defendant in each count of the information. Each count charges a separate and distinct offense, and the evidence in the law applicable to each count should be considered separately, uninfluenced by your decision as to any other count. The fact that you may find the defendant guilty or not guilty of one of the offenses charged should not control your verdicts as to any other offense charged against the defendant. The defendant may be found not guilty or guilty of any one or all of the offenses charged. Instruction 13. The court admitted certain evidence for a limited purpose. At the time, you were instructed not to consider it for any purpose other than the limited purpose for which it was admitted. You are again instructed that you cannot consider evidence admitted for a limited purpose except for the limited purpose for which it was admitted. Instruction 14. A crime is committed when the defendant has committed a voluntary act prohibited by law accompanied by a culpable mental state. Voluntary act means an act performed consciously as a result of effort or determination. Culpable mental state means after deliberation, intentionally or with intent, knowingly, recklessly, or with criminal negligence, as those terms are explained in this instruction. Proof of the commission of the act alone is not sufficient to prove that the defendant had the required culpable mental state. The culpable mental state is as much an element of the crime as the act itself and must be proven beyond a reasonable doubt, either by direct or circumstantial evidence. 
quote, after deliberation, end quote, means that the defendant acted not only intentionally, but also that the de decision to commit the act has been made after the exercise of reflection and judgment considering the act. An act committed after deliberation is never one which has been committed in a hasty or impulsive manner. A person acts, quote, intentionally, end quote, or, quote, with intent, end quote, when his conscious objective is to cause the specific result prescribed by the statute defining the offense. It is immaterial whether or not the result actually occurred. A person acts, quote, knowingly, end quote, with respect to conduct or to a circumstance described by a statute defining an offense when he is aware that his conduct is of such nature or that such circumstance exists. A person acts, quote, knowingly, end quote, with respect to a result of his conduct when he is aware that his conduct is practically certain to cause the result. A person acts, quote, recklessly, end quote, when he consciously disregards a substantial and unjustified risk that a result will occur or that a circumstance exists. A person acts, quote, with criminal negligence, end quote, when through a gross deviation from the standard of care that a reasonable person would exercise, he fails to perceive a substantial and unjustified risk that a result will occur or that, the circum or that a circumstance exists. Instruction 15. The elements of the crime of murder in the first degree after deliberation are one that the defendant, two, in the state of Colorado, at or about the date and place charged, three, after deliberation and with intent, A, to cause the death of a person other than himself, B, cause the death of Justin Zapata, also known as Angie Zapata. After considering all of the evidence, if you decide the prosecution has proven each of the elements beyond a reasonable doubt, you should find the defendant guilty of murder in the first degree after deliberation. After considering all of the evidence, if you decide the prosecution has failed to prove any one or more of the elements beyond a reasonable doubt, you should find the defendant not guilty of murder in the first degree after deliberation. Instruction 16. If you are not satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty of the offense charged, he may, however, be found guilty of any lesser offense, the commission of which is necessarily included in the offense charged if the evidence is sufficient to establish his guilt of the lesser offense beyond a reasonable doubt. The offense of murder in the first degree after deliberation as charged in the information in this case necessarily includes the lesser offenses of murder in the second degree, manslaughter, and criminally negligent homicide. The elements of the crime of murder in the second degree are, one, that the defendant, two, in the state of Colorado, at or about the date and place charged, three, knowingly, four, cause the death of Justin Zapata, also known as Angie Zapata. The elements of the crime of manslaughter are, one, that the defendant, two, in the state of Colorado, at or about the date and place charged, three, recklessly, four, cause the death of Justin Zapata, also known as Angie Zapata. The elements of the crime of criminally negligent homicide are, one, that the defendant, two, in the state of Colorado, at or about the date and place charged, three, cause the death of Justin Zapata, also known as Angie Zapata, for by conduct amounting to criminal negligence. You should bear in mind that the burden is always upon the prosecution to prove beyond a reasonable doubt each and every material element of any lesser included offense which is necessarily included in any offense charged in the information. The law never imposes upon the defendant in a criminal case the burden of calling any witnesses or producing any evidence. After considering all of the evidence, if you decide the prosecution has failed to prove any one or more elements of the crime charged or of a lesser included offense, you should find the defendant not guilty of the offense which has not been proven, proved, and you should so state in your verdict. While you may find the defendant not guilty of any or all of the crimes charged, or any or all of the lesser included offenses, you may not find the defendant guilty of more than one of the following offenses. Murder in the first degree after deliberation, murder in the second degree, manslaughter, and criminally negligent homicide. Instruction number 17. 
If you find the defendant not guilty of the lesser included offense of murder in the second degree, you should disregard this instruction. If, however, you find the defendant guilty of murder in the second degree, then you must answer the following question. Was the defendant acting upon a sudden heat of passion? The defendant was acting upon a sudden, excuse me, the defendant was acting upon a sudden heat of passion if one, the act causing the death was performed upon a sudden heat of passion and two, the sudden heat of passion was caused by a serious and highly provoking act of the intended victim and three, the intended victim's act of provocation was sufficient to excite an irresistible passion in a reasonable person and four, between the provocation and the killing, there was an insufficient interval of time for the voice of reason and humanity to be heard. It is the prosecution's burden to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant was not acting upon a sudden heat of passion. The prosecution must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that one or more of these elements did not exist in this case. After considering all of the evidence, if you decide the prosecution has proven beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant was not acting upon a sudden heat of passion, you should indicate no on the verdict form that has been provided. After considering all of the evidence, if you decide the prosecution has failed to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant was not acting upon a sudden heat of passion, you should indicate yes on the verdict form that has been provided. Your finding must be unanimous. Instruction number 18. The elements of the crime of bias motivated crime are one, that the defendant two in the state of Colorado at or about the date and place charged three, with the intent to intimidate or harass Justin Zapata, also known as Angie Zapata, four, because of his slash her actual or perceived sexual orientation, five, knowingly, six, caused bodily injury to Justin Zapata, also known as Angie Zapata. After considering all of the evidence, if you decide the prosecution has proven each of the elements beyond a reasonable doubt, you should find the defendant guilty of bias-motivated crime. After considering all of the evidence, if you decide the prosecution has failed to prove any one or more of the elements beyond a reasonable doubt, you should find the, you should find the defendant not guilty of bias-motivated crime. Instruction 19, the elements of identity theft are one, that the defendant, Alan Andrade, two, in the state of Colorado, at or about the date and place charged, three, knowingly, A, used or attempted to use, B, the personal identifying information, financial identifying information, or financial device of Monica Morgia, four, without permission or lawful authority, five, to obtain cash, credit, property, services, or any other thing of value, or to make a financial payment. After considering all of the evidence, if you decide the prosecution has failed to prove any one or more of the elements beyond a reasonable doubt, you should find the defendant not guilty of identity theft. After considering all of the evidence, if you decide the prosecution has proven each of the elements beyond a reasonable doubt, you should find the defendant guilty of identity theft. Instruction number 20. You are instructed that in order to convict the defendant of identity theft, you must unanimously agree on a particular instance or instances of identity theft. You must unanimously agree that the people have proven each and every element of the crime of identity theft, and you must unanimously agree as to a specific incident, incident or incidents of identity theft. Each member of the jury must agree that he or she believes that the same specific instant or instances of identity theft have been proven beyond a reasonable doubt. If you cannot unanimously agree upon any one or more specific incidences in which the defendant may have committed the act, you must acquit the defendant of identity theft. Instruction 21. The elements of aggravated motor vehicle theft in the first degree are one, that the defendant, Alan Andrade, two, in the state of Colorado, on or about the date and place charged, three, knowingly, A, obtained or exercised control over the motor vehicle of Monica or Gia, B, without authorization or by threat or deception, four, and the value of the motor vehicle was $20,000 or less, five, and the defendant retained possession or control over the motor vehicle for more than 24 hours, six, and used the motor vehicle in the commission of the crime of identity theft. After considering all of the evidence, if you decide the prosecution has failed to prove any one or more of the elements beyond a reasonable doubt, you should find the defendant not guilty of aggravated motor vehicle theft in the first degree. 
After considering all of the evidence, if you decide the prosecution has proven each of the elements beyond a reasonable doubt, you should find the defendant guilty of aggravated motor vehicle theft in the first degree. Instruction 22. Concerning the charges in this case, certain words and phrases have a particular meaning. The following are the definitions of these words and phrases. Act. Act means a bodily movement and includes words or possession of property. Attempt. Attempt. A person commits criminal attempt if acting with the kind of culpability otherwise required for commission of an offense. He or she engages in conduct constituting a substantial step toward the commission of the offense. A substantial step is any conduct, whether act, omission, or possession, which is strongly, strongly corroborative of the firmness of the actor's purpose to complete the commission of the offense. A substantial step is any conduct, whether act, omission, or possession, which is strongly corroborative of the firmness of the actor's purpose to complete the commission of the offense. Factual or legal impossibility of committing the offense is not a defense if the offense could have been committed had the attendant circumstances been as the actor believed them to be, nor is it a defense that the crime attempted was actually perpetrated by the accused. Bodily injury. Bodily injury means physical pain, illness, or any impairment of any physical or mental condition. Cause. Cause means the act or failure to act, which in natural and probable sequence produced the claimed injury. It is a cause without which the claimed injury would not have been occurred. Financial device. Financial device means any instrument or device that can be used to obtain cash, credit, property, services, or any other thing of value, or to make financial payments, including but not limited to a debit card. Sexual orientation. Sexual orientation means a person's actual or perceived orientation towards heterosexuality, homosexuality, bisexuality, or transgender status. Thing of value. Thing of value includes real property, tangible and intangible personal property, contract rights, uh, choses in action, services, confidential information, medical records information, and, and any other rights of use or enjoyment connected therewith. Instruction 23. Once you begin your deliberations, if you have a question, your, fur per, your four person should write the question on a piece of paper, sign it, and give it to the bailiff who will bring it to me. I may then confer with the attorneys as to the appropriate way to answer your question. However, there may be some questions that under the law I am not permitted to answer. If it is improper for me to answer the question, I will tell you that. Please do not try to guess about what the answer to your question might be or why I am not able to answer a particular question. I will read to you instruction number 24 at the conclusion of closing arguments, okay? And I'll also discuss with you how the verdict forms work. The prosecution may present the closing argument. Thank you, Your Honor. Engraved in stone on the Supreme Courthouse of the United States are the words equal protection under law. And that's what this case is about. This case is also about right versus wrong, and it's about protecting all members of our community. Throughout the course of this trial, you've heard a lot of testimony, a lot of testimony about Angie Zapata and who she was. She was a beloved sister, aunt, daughter, and friend. All of the close friends and family members that you heard testify talked about her being born in a boy's body but living as a female, and that she had been like this from a very early age, that she preferred to play with Barbies over toy trucks like most young boys would. And as she got older, instead of being called Justin, she asked to be called Angie. Her friends and family members accepted her as such and did call her Angie. And they constantly interacted as close-knit family and friends often do. And they constantly warned Angie to be safe. Be safe because there are people out there who will not accept you and who will hurt you. She contributed to her family by working as a babysitter for her older sister. And Angie recently moved to Greeley to live on her own. Angie was only 18 years old, content with who she was, and living as herself. And ultimately, ultimately, 
crucified. She was murdered because of this. Alan Andrade, Alan Andrade decided he should make the decision as to who lives and who dies. He crushed Angie's skull in with bone crushing blows from a fire extinguisher. It's impossible to imagine the sound of one's skull crushing by blows from a fire extinguisher. The cold steel forcefully hitting your skull time after time. You heard and saw what it was like for two sisters. Two sisters who constantly worried about Angie to one day find their young sister beaten, bloody, and stiff with the blanket stuck to her face from her dried blood. This was a horrific incident for them and an image that will be burned into their memory forever. The law does not tolerate or allow for murder because you hate someone for who they are. In fact, it is quite the opposite. The law protects everyone. The law protects me, the law protects you, and the law protects Angie, all as equal people. Now, I want to take a few minutes, and you can follow along if you want, you don't have to, but I want to go over the jury instructions with you because I know uh, during jury selection, I think the judge said at one point, you know, you'll have easy instructions to follow, and you might not agree with that once you go through them all. But I want to point out the elements for first degree murder, and that's in instruction number 15. And those are that the defendant in Colorado, on the date and place charged, after deliberation and with intent to, to cause the death of a person other than himself, cause the death of Angie Zapata. And I'm gonna get more into that in a minute because that is what we have proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Instruction number 16 is what's called lesser included offenses. These lesser included offenses minimize uh, the mental state and minimize the defendant's actions in this case. In fact, there are two charges on here that these facts certainly do not fit. And I don't think you'll even get to talk to him because if you decide he's guilty of first degree murder, you don't have to consider, consider any of the lesser included. And those are manslaughter and criminally negligent homicide. The other two charges, second degree murder and first degree murder, have the intent to kill. And that's what this case has all over it is the intent to kill. Now, I'm gonna get into it more as far as why this is first degree murder, and it is not a lesser included offense, and I want you to consider that while thinking about this, that I'm saying this is first degree murder, and that's also why I'm saying this is not any of these lesser included offenses. Also for those two charges, for example, manslaughter, you have to have a reckless state of mind. A reckless act, reckless, reckless is a car accident. This is much more than something reckless. His intent is seen at the crime scene. His intent is heard in the jail calls. This is clearly not negligent behavior, that the state of mind for that is conduct amounting to criminal negligence. That's when you fail to perceive a certain risk. Hitting someone time after time in the forehead with a fire extinguisher shows exactly what your intent was. It is not either of these two crimes. It is not either of these two crimes. It is nothing less than first degree murder. <clears throat> the judge also gave you an instruction, and it's instruction number 17. That instruction is for heat of passion, and I'll get into that more. But how this instruction works, you only consider heat of passion if you find him guilty of second degree murder, and then you consider heat of passion. Other than that, that doesn't enter into the equation. And briefly, the elements for the rest of the crimes um, instruction number 18 goes over bias motivated crime. And the elements of that charge are exactly what this man did. And elements are like a recipe. You add them all up and that's what the crime is. If it's proven, all the elements beyond a reasonable doubt. And I submit to you that the evidence clearly shows that this man committed a bias motivated crime. When he swung that fire extinguisher the very first time and hit Angie, that was a bias motivated crime. You heard his jail calls. You heard all the evidence. That is the definition of a bias-motivated crime. 
Instruction number 19 is identity theft. And the evidence proves beyond a reasonable doubt, beyond any reasonable doubt, that the defendant committed identity theft. He even admitted as much in his interview with law enforcement. If you remember back to that, he told Detective Tharp that he took and used the debit card that he found in the car. Monica highlighted uh, charges on her statement that were not hers. There is no doubt that he committed those crimes. And that also includes aggravated motor vehicle theft, which is instruction uh, number 21. Those elements have been met clearly. The defendant admitted to that. He took the car after he killed Angie and kept it as his own for almost two weeks, from July 17th to July 30th when he was arrested out of that car. And I want to talk briefly about when you're back there discussing this case. Every decision you make must be unanimous. So for example, if it's 10 to 2 one way or the other on a charge, that's not unanimous. And you have to keep considering it. Um, every decision you make must be unanimous as a jury. Getting back to the two property charges I just talked about, those are also very instructive for you to look at as far as this defendant. This defendant made use of Monica, Monica Murguia's credit card and car as if they were his own. It's pretty obvious he didn't give a second thought to using someone else's property as his own. But I want to talk about why this is clearly first degree murder and why the evidence has proven beyond a reasonable doubt that this is first degree murder. We know from all the circumstantial and direct evidence that the defendant went to the victim's apartment on July 14th. And we know he is the one who murdered Angie Zapata based on all the evidence. The defense even conceded as much in their opening statement. The DNA, the admissions to law enforcement, the statements to law enforcement, witness testimony, and the jail calls make it quite clear that this is the man that committed the murder. This is not a whodunit. Mr. Andrade used a fire extinguisher to kill Angie Zapata. And here's why this is first degree murder after deliberation. After deliberation is not a certain set amount of time. It can be something as simple as driving down the road and you look over your shoulder to change lanes and then change lanes. You deliberated about changing lanes right there. It doesn't have to be days, hours, it can be seconds. And the law says as much. In fact, in this case, with the facts you've heard, you can find that it was deliberation for the defendant to walk over to where that fire extinguisher was in the wall, take it off the wall and start hitting Angie with it. That is enough time for deliberation. This is briefly, and I'll get into it more detail, what I'm talking about that shows more. It shows what we know here. There's lack of sexual activity near the time of the homicide, which clearly shoots down what the defense said was a provocation and immediate reaction. In fact, the evidence seems quite the opposite of that. The defendant knew well before the time he murdered Angie Zapata, that she was transgender. The cell phone records and the crime scene all show after deliberation. Now, like I said, we don't know if sexual activity occurred, but what the evidence does show you, what the evidence does show you without speculating is that there was no sexual activity at or near the time of the homicide. And what can we look at for that? the defendant's own words on the jail calls. Time after time, the defendant says there was no sex. I didn't have no sex with no one. He says it time after time. There's a lack of DNA on the victim. There's a lack of hair and fibers on the victim. The beds are situated as if they're roommates, like JJ when he lived there. One mattress in the front room and a mattress in the bedroom. The clothes the victim was found in. Even JJ said she was dressed up all the time. She's wearing sweats and a t-shirt. Everyone that talked about Angie described her as always dressing up to go out. Her family and friends describe her as picking up a quote unquote friend to go to court with her the following day. And again, her family constantly warned Angie to be careful. And there's been no evidence presented that she was nothing but careful. 
Monica confirmed that when she talked to boyfriends of Angie, they knew that she was transgender, that she was in fact being safe. The only sexual evidence in this case indicates the defendant knew what he was doing and was experimenting or doing something by himself. A pink vibrator found at the crime scene with no one's DNA on it but the defendant's. 19.62 nanograms on a pink vibrator. 19.62 nanograms of DNA. And compare that with the, a little over three nanograms that's on a cigarette that you actually put in your mouth. It's clear from the evidence the defendant knew well before he committed murder that Angie was transgender. And we know ultimately of the defendant's deep-seated feelings towards homosexuals. So if the defendant knew Angie was a biological male well before he chose to murder her, this is nothing less than first-degree murder. And here's what we know and why we know the defendant knew before the murder Angie was transgender. More evidence of this. And this is besides the fact we don't know what Angie told him. The defendant took the cell phone with all the text messages. There's no other communications. We can't get text messages from the phone company. The defendant covered the tracks of any communications, any record of communications. He took the cell phone. But here's what the evidence also shows you. That they were together off and on for over three days from July 14th through July 16th in a tiny one bedroom apartment. A 400 square foot, one bedroom apartment. He was left there with no transportation. And the evidence direct and circumstantial shows the defendant was picked up Monday night by Angie, driven to the apartment, and defense counsel even said as much in their mini opening that they were together those three days. The defendant confirms it in a jail phone call when Felicia talks about the weekend before and you were up in Greeley for those three days following that weekend. That's mentioned in a jail call. We know the defendant wasn't at Angie Tyree's house at this time. We know he wasn't at Felicia's house. He was with the victim from Monday night until Wednesday when he killed her. All of these witnesses, the family members, describe Angie going to Thornton to pick up a guy to go to court with her. A guy from Thornton, this guy lived in Thornton, the defendant lived in Thornton, drove him home, stayed with her that night, went to court with her the next day, went out to lunch according to Ashley, and then Angie went back and resumed her duties as a babysitter. The text messaging, as you'll see in a minute, matches what these witnesses say in their testimony for the times that Angie was with the defendant and with her family members. On the day of the murder, and I talked about this earlier, uh, the, bed, the beds were in separate rooms, and the defendant was alone in the victim's house for 12 hours that day. For more than 12 hours. Monica testified that Angie came to work about 6.45, got home a little before 5, and then Angie went to uh, her friend Maricela's house for a couple hours after she got off work. The first sign we see of the two of them together is at 7.30 on the liquor store video. That means the defendant was alone in Greeley, where he has no ties, for over 12 hours, and only texts the victim 22 times that day. That shows what's going through his mind. The texts start out hot and heavy. On the last day, there's 22, and of those, 13 are within a 40-minute time frame. And all the evidence logically shows the defendant had to have gone to court with Angie that day. It doesn't make sense to go up to Thornton, pick the defendant up to go to court, be seen by a clerk clerk sitting by the defendant, or sitting by a male, noting this because they'd seen Angie several times before. It's not logical to think that this is not the defendant, who's from Thornton, who Angie went to pick up to go to court with her. And so, while he's sitting by Angie in court, her case is called up. City of Greeley versus Justin Zapata. There's a pause, and Angie walks from where she's seated and goes up to address the judge. So this statement 
The judge calling the case was, inter was heard on the microphones throughout the courtroom. And that's the only sound of Angie's voice you'll get to hear. <clears throat> and I want you to recall one of the defense own witnesses, Mr. Hedstrom, testified that Angie's voice even sounded like a male trying to sound like a female. And he'd talked to her a few times on the phone. This man had talked to her off and on in face and over the in person and over the cell phone over four days straight. One call alone for 82 minutes. Mary Morales, the neighbor across the hall, said it was immediately apparent that the defendant was a male. Everyone that testified knew Angie was born Justin and now is living as Angie. But what else shows that this is first degree murder? And the defendant knew Angie was transgender. Again, look at this scene, the clean scene, the scene that was cleaned up by this man, that he took evidence, evidence that would show communications be between him and the victim. The victim's clothing that I pointed out earlier. She clearly had some level of comfort with him in light of what all the witnesses said. All of the evidence indicates that Angie was in fact up front with who she was, with being biological male. Even the defense brought up Maricela Meza to talk about uh, Angie and her going to bars and she talks to guys. Well, as it turned out, that was gay, lesbian, and transgender night of Buchanan's. Makes sense that she was talking to guys on that night. Because the evidence clearly shows the defendant knew well before that fateful night of July 16th that the defendant knew Angie Zapata was a transge transgender person. This crime was committed after deliberation. The defendant had no way home, no car. He couldn't call either of the girls he was stringing along. He couldn't call Felicia Mendoza or Angie Tyree. So he thought about it and tried to figure out how to get out of the situation because as you heard on the jail calls, he hated people like this. He chose not to leave and made a conscious decision to stay and address the situation. And remember, he had very few communications with the victim the last day. All of the things add up to him knowing that Angie was transgender. He determined the best way to get out of this situation was murder, and that's what he did. Another thing you have to find beyond a reasonable doubt to find him guilty of first degree murder is intent to kill. And this is what I'm talking about, an overview of the specific intent to kill. In this case, we have the use of a weapon. The defendant's actions after the crime show what he was doing during the crime, that this was nothing but an ambush attack, the crime scene again, and the jail phone calls. The use of a weapon shows what one's intent is. The defendant didn't push. The defendant didn't hit with his hands. He hit with a fire extinguisher and crushed Angie's skull. The lack of content, contact between the two of them on the day of the homicide show what he was thinking about for 12 hours alone in the apartment all day. His actions after the crime show his intent as well as clear evidence of a guilty mind. He cleans the scene takes the victim's purses and gives them as gifts to his girlfriend, closes his MoCo Space account, deletes all communications on his cell phone, takes the fire extinguisher with him. And you can see the bracket in this picture. Trevor Anderson testified. Trevor Anderson testified that no fire extinguisher was found at the scene. Clay Buckingham gave no evidence of a fire extinguisher being found at the scene until one is found in some month and a half later in the median on Highway 34. He took the victim's cell phone that would contain communications between the two of them. Cleans up the scene, covers Angie's body with a blanket, and leaves. A bloody blanket found by Ashley and Monica. If this were some accident, some reckless act, wouldn't one call for help instead of covering the body and leaving the scene? He steals Monica's car, containing her debit card, 
and keeps it as his own and drives back to Angie Tyree's house. But the content of his jail calls gives you a window into the defendant's mind. It shows that it was pure hatred. And I want you to think about this. The defense categorizes these as casual joking phone calls. He was arrested July 30th for murdering Angie Zapata, who was transgendered. Most of these calls take place between July 30th and August 3rd. There's only one call that's after that. And he has the audacity to say, knowing he's being recorded, shortly after being arrested, these things that you heard. And also keep in mind that Detective Tharp, Detective Tharp had interviewed the defendant and explained to him the different levels of homicide. And he was just trying to figure out what we're looking at here. But the defendant says things like, uh, when Felicia asked if it happened right away or you guys hung out for a while, and the defendant said, no, no, it happened right away. Well, clearly that's not the case here. The evidence shows that that's not the case here. The defendant goes on to say, I didn't have no quote unquote sex with that motherfucker. I didn't do nothing with no one, among other statements, referring to the victim in derogatory terms. The defendant says this, gay things need to die. Felicia is saying something about her cell phone dying. The defendant says, well, your cell phone's gay. And then he says, gay things need to die shortly after being booked in on the murder for, of a transgendered person. He brags about wielding a fire extinguisher and how he's a super celebrity at the jail because he's a fire extinguisher wielding person. How it makes him a tough guy at the jail. Talking to Felicia about one of her friends and calls him a gay fool. Tell him I'll kill him too, pink shirt wearing motherfucker. This is one of the only times in the calls he shows emotion when talking about someone talking trash to him or uh, when he's talking about homosexuals. That's the only time he shows emotion in the calls, not when talking to Felicia about the possible charges or the possible penalties with this case. He doesn't say, I didn't do it, it was an accident or anything like that. When Felicia says something about the death penalty to him, he asks her right after that, did you talk to my sister? He even has the audacity to discuss selling his story to the press for $55,000, somehow making money off of Angie's death. Again, he refers to the victim as it, among other things. He even states a couple of times, someone, someone living like that, well, they need to be held accountable. Does it even sound reasonable how Mr. Andrade's idea is of holding someone accountable? It's time for this man to be held accountable. In another call, he went up and said, it's not like I went up and shot a school teacher or killed a straight law abiding citizen. That gives you a window into the defendant's mindset. He tells Felicia, Felicia asked if the victim had breasts, but they're still referring to her in derogatory terms. Um, the defendant says something to the effect, I didn't even get that far. I didn't even get that far indicating there is no passion between the two of them for this so-called heat of passion defense. Again, what else shows intent? And I've talked about this. The crime scene, the crime scene, the multiple blows to the head, swinging the fire extinguisher, bone crushing time after time. Detective Buckingham said the scene revealed that the victim was hit while on the ground or possibly under the blanket. That might indicate that she was even sleeping. This was an ambush attack. There's no defensive wounds on the victim. The de defendant's DNA was not under the victim's fingernails. This was an all-out blitz attack to get this over as soon as possible, to take all of the evidence and return to Denver. What else shows this? You heard witnesses that were neighbors. They heard nothing. They heard nothing. No confrontation, no yelling, they heard nothing. If this was some heat of passion attack, wouldn't there be passionate screaming? They heard nothing, it was an ambush. But there is no doubt that the defendant had the specific intent to kill in this case. His punishing blows were focused in one place and one place only, the head. Angie Zapata's head. There were no strikes anywhere else on her body.
I want to briefly go over a timeline uh, with you just over the days uh, that we're talking about. And just to clarify things, because I think it's a little easier with, with an actual calendar in front of you. And I first want to talk about July 12th, or July 12th of 2008. July 12th, 2008. On July 12th, 2008, the evidence shows there were 272 texts between the defendant and Andy. 272 texts. On July 13th, Fifty-nine texts and four actual calls. <laughs> On July 14th, the day Angie went down and picked him up in Fort and brought him back to her apartment. She went down and picked him up, drove, her, drove him back to Greeley. I'm putting a picture of her apartment there. I don't know if everyone can see the blue pictures are pictures of the cell phone indicating communications. And that's the day the defendant was brought to her apartment. And what tells us this? 236 texts between the two of them, 10 calls, and all communication between the phones ended at 825. And that's because they are together. And if you look at the phone records, that's when the communications begin between Stephanie, her sister, who she went to get money from. The communications begin between the two of them at that time. <coughs> July 15th, we didn't have a picture of the municipal court, but the evidence is clear. That's the day they're in court together. Again, and I don't know if you can read that or if the screens work in front of you. But Angie is at municipal court from approximately 8.30 to 10 a.m. Her case is called at 9.47, and there are 67 texts between the defendant and Angie on that day. No texts between 8.15 in the morning and 2 in the afternoon while they are at court together and then go out to lunch together as described by Ashley. I would point out, while they're in court, Stephanie and Angie are exchanging texts. So it's obvious Angie had her cell phone in there, but there's no reason to text someone who's sitting right next to you. When Angie goes back to resume babysitting duties, uh, the cell communications begin again between the defendant and Angie at approximately 2.30. She again left him alone at her apartment that day, according to what Ashley told us and what Monica told us. And then there are no more communications between them after 7 p.m., which is when she arrived home from work on July, July 15th. On July 16th, the day the defendant murdered Angie Zapata, On July 16th, Angie went to work at 645 and left the defendant alone in her apartment. There are 13 texts between the defendant and Angie from 1245 to 123. And then Angie goes to Marcella's after work for a few hours. She has to leave because there's a guy at her apartment who she left there all day with nothing to do and nothing to eat. There's calls between Monica and Angie that Monica testified about arranging for babysitting duties the following day. Then at 7.30 on July 16th, we see Angie driving the PT Cruiser and taking the defendant to the liquor store. At 9.40 p.m., Angie sends Stephanie a text saying she wanted a new picture of her that several witnesses testified to. And sometime after 9.40, before midnight, the defendant murdered Angie Zapata. Angie Tyree said he arrived home on July 16th around midnight. And if you remember, um, the neighbor testified that at 1230 when he got home early in the morning of the 17th, the PT cruiser wasn't parked there. The defendant had committed the crime and left. He'd committed the crime, taken uh, the victim's 
the victim's sister's car and the debit card, and you'll see from the bank statement and use the card on a number of different occasions. On July 26, there's transactions with Monica's debit card. On July 27, on 28th, there's uses of the debit card. <coughs> and then on July 30th, 14 days after he committed the murder, the defendant is arrested in the victim's sister's car, and Angie Tyrese and Thornton. This is what the evidence shows happened in this case. This is what's clear from all the evidence. The defense talked in their opening statement that this was a snap decision followed by an immediate reaction, uh, alleging some sort of heat of passion. And that has been disproven beyond a reasonable doubt. This was not heat of passion. This was first degree murder. And I want to talk to you about why this is not heat of passion. You have this in instruction number 17, I believe. And I highlighted in red the word reasonable person. All of us think we're reasonable. And Mr. Andrade's acts were anything but reasonable. A reasonable person would have left if they were so repulsed by, what they, by the person they were being with. This is not heat of passion. The defendant even alludes to this in one of his phone calls, and that's if you believe the defendant only found out right away that he stated maybe others were in this position, but they had the common sense to leave. The defendant is well aware he's not a reasonable person. This is not heat of passion for a number of other reasons. It's not heat of passion for all the reasons this is first degree murder. He knew well before the time this murder was committed that Angie was transgendered. He's never remorseful in jail phone calls, never says it was a sudden heat of passion or shows any remorse for the victim. In fact, all the calls are quite the opposite, I would submit after hearing those. Heat of passion would minimize this murder and in some sense mean Angie, who was 18 years old, a biological teenage boy who had been living as a female for a number of years, saying she was being deceitful in being who she was. And again, Angie knew to be cautious. There's no evidence that she was anything but cautious. Saying that this is heat of passion is allowing someone to be killed for living as who they are. And the law, the law is meant to protect everyone. And another thing, and Ms. Mendoza talks about this in one of her calls. The defense is trying to claim that this man is so passionately upset and so repulsed to take the ultimate step, to take the ultimate step and kill someone, take their life. Why on earth do you keep the car of some, someone or a situation that repulsed you this much and use it as your own to be a constant reminder of something that repulsed you enough to take a life? Why would you take the purses of the victim and give them to your girlfriend as a, as, as a gift if you're so repulsed enough to take a life because this is not heat of passion. This is not heat of passion. This is murder after deliberation. There's no evidence of passion for a provocation. As we've talked about, no DNA on the victim of the defendants, uh, no hair and fibers Actually, of the defendants. No, this is misstating the um, what the district attorney has to prove. The jury needs to rely on their own individual memories with regard to the facts of this case. You're welcome to continue. There is no passion for the so-called heat of passion for, for, a, for finding out something in immediate reaction. In fact, what is clear is that the defendant had more than enough time to do what a reasonable person would have done, walk away. Walk away and get out of the situation, what any reasonable person would, would have done. Ladies and gentlemen, we have sat through several long days of testimony and you have a very serious decision to make. The evidence is clear beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty of first degree murder and first degree murder only, not a lesser included offense. 
there is nothing to minimize this crime. Everything shows the defendant committed this crime with the specific intent to kill Angie Zapata and after deliberation. It's also very clear that he's guilty of the other charges, a bias motivated crime, the aggravated motor vehicle theft, and ID theft. And judging this case is gonna be challenged, it is challenging. This was challenging for police and everyone involved because the victim was transgender and you're dealing with something you haven't dealt with before. But this case is not about the victim being transgendered. This case is about this man committing first degree murder after deliberation and being an unreasonable person. Anything but a reasonable person. It's about an unreasonable and deep-seated anger that he unleashed on Angie Zapata on July 16th but as, because she was a transgender woman or a transgender girl since she was only 18 years old. Angie was murdered intentionally and after deliberation on July 16th by this man. She was only 18 years old when she was brutally torn away from this world. And this man took it upon himself to play the role of judge, jury, and executioner. Like he said in the jail phone call, he thought that's how he should hold Angie accountable. Now he needs to be held accountable. His own statements in the jail call betray the way he values Angie's life. The way he thought of her as less than, a, less than any of us because of who she was. And he's counting on society and the jury to do the same in this case. But the evidence in the law is clear. Everyone deserves equal protection under law, and no one deserves to die like this. Find him guilty of all counts. Thank you. I couldn't, I don't know, I don't know. It happened so freaking fast and so hard. I, they couldn't stop it. I swear it was one of those things that just, that happens on TV. You know, you don't think it could happen to you, but I swear to God, I started thinking about everything after, you know, like after the fact. I was like, fuck, fuck, fuck. I knew it was over. Those are Mr. Andrade's words from one of the phone calls that he had with Felicia Mendoza on August 1st, when he was describing to her what happened. Those are his words about what happened. That's the only evidence you have about what happened that night in Justin Zapata's apartment. We told you from the beginning that this case was about deception and Mr. Andrade's immediate reaction to that deception. And that's all the evidence you have is what he says. Mr. Andrade reacted immediately to a situation he was placed in, a situation that he didn't plan for, a situation that he didn't know what to do. Nobody thinks of this. It's just like he said, this is like one of those things that happens on TV. Nobody thinks about how they'll handle it. The district attorney told you in their opening statement that this is about a young teen girl. That's not what this case is about. Justin Zapata deceived a number of people. He deceived Mr. Andrade. He was not a girl. He was a boy. He was a man. Justin Zapata dressed like a girl. You've heard from all different witnesses, friends and family as well as other independent witnesses, that Justin Zapata had long hair, he wore makeup, he wore women's clothing, he wore women's shoes, his apartment was decorated with flowers, vases, stuffed animals. You saw photographs of the apartment. You know what it looked like. You heard from his friend, um, David Hedstrom, who's also a friend of a good friend of Monica's and works with Monica, that it looked like a girl's apartment. JJ Alejandro lived there, described it as a girl's apartment. There were women's clothing in there, bras, panties, high heels. Everything about that apartment indicated that a woman lived there. He carried a purse. JJ Alejandro told you that the apartment smelled like a female's apartment. There was a pink vibrator in the apartment. Monica described Justin as her prettiest sister. You've seen pictures of Justin Zapata. In the beginning of this case, when we were doing jury selection, we talked about circumstantial evidence. What does the circumstantial evidence here tell you about Justin Zapata? It tells you that Justin Zapata lived like a female, looked like a female, sounded like a female. You heard other witnesses talk about how he sounded like a woman. Everything about him was like a woman.
That's what Mr. Andrade believed. Mr. Andrade met Justin Zapata, but when he met him, he met him as Angie. And he believed that the person he was going to spend time with in Greeley was Angie. When he found out that it wasn't Angie and that it was actually Justin, he lost control. He just reacted, didn't think about anything. He didn't commit the crime of first degree murder. He didn't commit second degree murder. He didn't commit manslaughter. He committed something less than that. He didn't think about anything. There was nothing going through his head at that time. This case is not about Justin's lifestyle, whether it's right or wrong, or good or bad, or anything like that. The case is about whether Mr. Andrade committed the crime of first degree murder, and whether he committed a bias motivated crime. And I'm gonna focus mainly on those two issues during my closing argument. You've heard the evidence with regard to the auto theft and the identity theft, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about those, those two charges. This is a confusing case and it is a difficult case. And what you've been instructed is you're not allowed to let sympathy enter into your judgment on this case in any way. The district attorney talked to you about it being a difficult case. You've heard every witness and a number of different people refer to Justin as various different um, names during the trial. Justin, Angie, he's been referred to as a male, as a female. It's a confusing case, but your job is to put that aside and make a decision about whether the district attorney has proven beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Andrade committed the crime of first degree murder. And he didn't. They have not proven that beyond a reasonable doubt. It's their burden to prove that to you. And they have not met that burden. So I'm asking you to consider the other lesser charges and make a decision about what you believe Mr. Andrade has done in this case. The district attorney talked a lot about these phone calls, the jail phone calls, and I'm gonna talk about them as well. And you may not like some of the things that Alan Andrade said in those phone calls. You may not agree with some of the things he said, but that doesn't make him guilty of first degree murder. The fact that he maybe made some jokes or made some statements that were in poor taste does not make him guilty of first degree murder. It doesn't make him guilty of a bias motivated crime. What you need to decide is what was in his head. What was his culpable mental state at the time that these actions happened? At the time these things happened? You've, we've talked about how a crime is consists of a, is made up of a voluntary act and a culpable mental state. So your job is to decide what that culpable mental state was, and it certainly wasn't with intent and after deliberation. Justin had deceived a lot of people about a lot of things. He deceived Mr. Andrade about his um, gender, his true gender. You've also heard testimony that Justin Zapata went to bars, El Sol, Bucanas. He also went to the liquor store on a regular basis, so much so that the owner of the liquor store knew him and knew what kind of car he drove. Justin deceived a lot of people. The district attorney's opening statement talked about, they talked about how Justin Zapata was maybe looking for a new roommate. Justin Zapata was not looking for a roommate. Um, he was maybe on this MoCo Space site. There's been testimony that he had a MoCo Space account, that Mr. Andrade had a MoCo Space account. Justin Zapata's mother, Maria Zapata, told you that Justin was gonna move in with her. You also heard testimony that um, he that Looney might be moving back in with Justin. He wasn't looking for a roommate. And we know that, not just from that those people's testimony, but we know that because common sense tells you Justin Zapata was not looking for a roommate. There was only one reason Alan Andrade came to Greeley to meet with Justin Zapata, and that was for sex. You've heard testimony that there was absolutely no communication between these two people prior to July 12th. Detective Tharp testified that they got phone records back to January of 2008, and the first contact ever known between Justin Zapata and Alan Andrade was on July 12th, and it was from some text messages. There were text messages sent on July 12th, but no phone calls. On July 13th, there were several different phone calls, but when we looked at the phone records yesterday, you'll recall that there was only one phone call that resulted in a conversation. It was a four and a half minute conversation. So on July 13th, which is Sunday, there was one four and a half minute phone call and some text messages. 
Then what the district attorney wants you to believe is that on July 14th, there were these phone calls and some text messages, and then that night, Justin Zapata went down to pick up Alan Andrade from the metro area to be a roommate, maybe. The last call on that night was July was at 8.25 p.m., which does not coincide with the times that Stephanie Zapata and Miranda Martinez testified about Justin coming over to their house. <clears throat> They testified that he called and came to the house to pick up the money um, about a half an hour later. And that call was at around 7.30, 7.45 p.m. on Monday night, July 14th. There's only one reason two people agree to spend the night together after several text messages and phone calls. Those phone calls, the ones that happened on the 13th and the 14th, consisted of a total of two and a half hours. There's only one per run. There's only one reason two people talk for two and a half hours on the phone and then decide to spend the night together. The prosecution has been making this argument that there was no sexual contact, that there's no evidence of sexual contact. Again, I'll take you back to when we were choosing a jury, and the district attorney spent so much time talking about circumstantial evidence and what does circumstantial evidence show? The circumstantial evidence here shows that there was some sexual contact between the two of them. Felicia Mendoza was asking Mr. Andrade if the person he was with had boobs. That's what she said. And he said, yeah, well, partial. I think they were partial. I don't know. I didn't even get that far, you know? Once I found out, it was, once I found out, I didn't even get that far. That's what Mr. Andrade said to Felicia Mendoza. There was, there is evidence of sexual contact. The district attorney wants you to believe that because there is no, um, semen on these anal and oral swabs that there's no evidence of sexual contact. He wants to believe that since there's no hair, there's no evidence of sexual contact. Use your common sense. There can be a, a lot of different ways to have sexual contact that don't result in semen or hair being on somebody else's body. They've made a big issue out of this vibrator that was found in the apartment. and. They want you to believe that Mr. Andrade, I guess, bought, brought that vibrator with him and used it somehow alone. It doesn't make sense. That's evidence of sexual contact. There's a, vib a pink vibrator laying on the floor of Justin Zapata's apartment. Felicia Mendoza told you that she never had seen Mr. Andrade with a vibrator. She had never seen that before, never knew that he owned it. That's more evidence that a woman lived in the apartment. Mr. Andrade's DNA was found on that vibrator. Sarah Lewis testified that that could have been from touching. If somebody had sweaty hands, that could be a way their DNA gets on the vibrator. There was no semen. There was no blood. There was no other evidence found on that vibrator. They want to argue that Justin Zapata's DNA wasn't found on the vibrator. His DNA wasn't found on one of the purses that was tested either. One of the purses didn't have Justin's DNA on and it used to be Justin's purse. They're making an issue out of these phone calls with Felicia Mendoza and how Mr. Andrade told Felicia, I didn't have sex with no one. Um, I, didn't, I wasn't with anyone else. He's talking to his very distraught girlfriend at the time. You heard Felicia's phone calls. You could see how emotional and upset she was. Is he, does it make sense that he would tell her that he had some kind of sexual contact with her? You heard Mr. Andrade during those phone calls. That doesn't make sense. He was trying to comfort her. He was trying to make her feel better. He was trying to make things easier for her. He was worried about her. And he wasn't going to make it worse for her by telling her this information. The district attorney told you that there were two beds in the apartment. You saw the pictures. There was a mattress on the living room floor and a mattress in the bedroom. There's an obvious reason for that. 
Justin Zapata didn't want to sleep in the same bed as Alan Andrade because he was keeping the secret from him. That's clear. There was no, it would be, un, that's more evidence that Alan Andrade did not know Justin's true identity. Justin was keeping that a secret from him. You've heard some about the physical evidence in this case as well. This fire extinguisher that the prosecution is um, claiming is the, the murder weapon in this case. You heard Sarah Lewis testify that she didn't test this for DNA because there was no blood on it. She tested a number of other items for DNA, cigarette butts, purses. There was no blood on those items, but they chose not to test this for DNA. They haven't proven to you that this is what was in fact used. They're saying that it was because there's no fire extinguisher in the apartment, but you don't know that this is the one that was used, if one was used at all. There's a cigarette butt found in the apartment that had a mixture of DNA on it. It had Mr. Andrade's and Mr. Zapata's DNA, both on the cigarette butt. That shows that there was some level of closeness there. They were sharing a cigarette. They want you to believe that Mr. Andrade planned to do this, that he wiped down the scene, he tried to clean up the scene. And what you've heard about is that there were some four 40 ounce beer bottles in the sink that had water run over them. And then you heard that a vodka bottle and a rum bottle had been wiped down, like assume, making it sound like they were wiped down for fingerprints. But nothing else in the apartment had been wiped down. Clay Buckingham told you that the door area hadn't been wiped down. There, if Mr. Andrade was trying to clean up the crime scene so well to cover this up, this whole thing that he had planned, wouldn't he have taken these other items, the cigarette butt, the vibrator, if he knew he had touched that? Wouldn't he have wiped down windows? You heard um, Detective Anderson testify that five latent prints, five fingerprints were taken from the window. He didn't clean up this crime scene. He didn't wipe everything down meticulously. There was no plan here. You heard the district attorney talk about the multiple blows to Justin's body and that this was, that's evidence of intent to kill. I'm arguing exactly the opposite. That is not intent to kill. Dr. Wilkerson testified that Justin Zapata had injuries to the front of his face only. He couldn't tell you how many times Justin Zapata had been struck. All he could say is more than one. That's it. There were no injuries to the back, no injuries to the rest of the body, just to the front of the face. That's evidence that this happened very quickly. Mr. Andrade just reacted to what happened. Justin Zapata's um, underwear were tested by Sarah Lewis and they were tested and she found that there were semen on his underwear. It was his own semen, but there was semen. Again, that's evidence that there may have been sexual contact between the two of them. In order for the district attorney to prove to you beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Andrade committed the crime of first degree murder, you have to jump to a lot of conclusions. You have to assume a lot of things that have not been proven to you beyond a reasonable doubt. Here's what the district attorney wants you to believe to support the, this crime, that he acted um, intentionally or with intent when his conscious objective is to cause the specific result prescribed by the statute defining the offense. They have to prove to you that, just, that Mr. Andrade knew that Justin Zapata was a male, biologically male, and their evidence for you on that doesn't add up. They have to prove that he acted after deliberation, that Mr. Andrade acted after deliberation. What that means is that not o the term after deliberation means not only intentionally, but also that the decision to commit the act has been made after the exercise of reflection and judgment concerning the act. An act committed after deliberation is never one which has been committed in a hasty or impulsive manner. 
Never one that's been committed in a hasty or impulsive manner. What they want you to believe is that Mr. Andrade, who hates transgendered people so much that he planned to kill one individual who was transgendered, they want you to believe that Mr. Andrade went to court with Justin on the morning of July 15th. You heard that Justin's case was called up at 9.47 a.m. Shanna Tollefson came in and testified that the docket started at 8.30, and they did it sort of on a first-come, first-served basis, that 50 to 100 people came through the courtroom. And so they want you to believe that Mr. Andrade sat in the courtroom with Justin Zapata, listened to the case be called People v. Justin Zapata, and at that time learned that Justin was a man. That was Tuesday morning, July 15th at about 9.45. And then Alan Andrade, who hates transgendered people so much that he wanted to kill Justin, spent the next day, spent the rest of that day with Justin Zapata. Went home, spent the night with Justin Zapata. When Justin left in the morning of the 16th to go to work, Alan sat around the house all day just waiting for Justin to come home and planned this killing. That he thought about it all day and that when he, what he planned was that when Justin comes home that he was gonna kill him with a fire extinguisher. Does that make any sense to you? Mr. Andrade was up here in Greeley with no car. Justin had gone to Thornton to pick him up. He didn't have a car. He didn't have a way to leave. And then he cleaned up the scene, that he wiped down everything. That was the planning that they're saying went into this. I want to go back to the municipal court issue. <clears throat> you heard Detective Knott testify that they did get a description of the person who was in municipal court with them from a woman named Crystal. You've never heard about that. Shanna Tollefson came in here and testified that she specifically remembered seeing Justin Zapata in court that day with a man because she was sitting up at the clerk's bench right next to the judge and she had recognized him from previous appearances in court and they paid attention because this is a person who was different so they they talked about him. So that's how she knew who he was. She says that she saw him in the courtroom with a man but didn't see him walk into the court room with the man, didn't see if Justin came from outside with the man or ran into the, some person inside the courtroom. She's told you that she did see media reports about this case afterward and she did follow it. She did know Justin and so she kind of followed the case. So she saw media reports about it but never called the police to say, oh, you know, that man in the in the paper, that man that was in, is it is the same man who was in court with Justin Zapata. That didn't happen because it wasn't Alan Andrade in court with Justin Zapata that morning. There's absolutely no evidence of that. They want you to believe that he sat there and heard that and then spent the next 36 hours with a man that he despised so much that he was gonna kill him with a fire extinguisher when he got home. That doesn't make any sense at all. They're making an issue out of these text messages that there were no text messages sent back and forth between Justin Zapata and Alan Andrade on the, during the time that Justin was in court. And we know Justin had his phone because he was texting with his sister, Stephanie, while he was in court. Well, how do you explain the text messages, the 14 text messages on Tuesday morning, July 15th, from 7.59 a.m. to 8.12 a.m. That's 18 minutes before Justin was due to be in court at 8.30. They had 14 text messages together while they're on their way to court, and, and Alan had spent the night with Justin? That doesn't make any sense. Where do those come from? They were texting that morning because they weren't together. Justin and Alan were not together on the morning of July 15th, and he did not go to court with him. Court finished at around 9.50 or so. The case was called at 9.47. You heard a recording from it. It was very short, very quick. And then the next text message wasn't until 2 o'clock. Justin went over to his sister Ashley's um, later that afternoon. And you heard her testify that Justin told her that he went to court that morning with a friend and then went to lunch with a friend. That wasn't Mr. Andrade, and there weren't text messages between the two of them because Justin was with someone else. We don't know who. 
We don't know who because he kept secrets. He never told his sister who he was with. He just said, I was with a friend. He told different stories to different people about who was at his house during these few days. His friends and family didn't really know him anymore. They testified that when he moved up to Greeley, he kind of changed and they kind of lost touch with him. That's because he was doing things that he knew they wouldn't approve of. The district attorney wants you to think they were together during this time and so there were no text messages. I think he said in his closing argument that, you know, in the beginning, these text messages were all hot and heavy. There were a whole bunch of them. And that this day there weren't any, so, and that's because they were together. Well, on the morning of July 16th, which is the next day after court, Wednesday, July 16th, you'll see that there were no text messages that morning. The first text message is at 1245, and the last one is at 855, July 16th in the evening, 855 p.m. We know they weren't together that morning because Justin was babysitting for his sister Monica. That was the testimony. So there were no text messages that morning just because there weren't any. Just like the day before, there weren't any text messages while Justin was in court. <clears throat> On the night of July 16th, Justin Zapata finished babysitting and then he went over to his friend Marticella Meza's house. And while he was there, she told you that he seemed kind of nervous, seemed like he was keeping something from her, seemed like he wasn't telling her something. And they were very close friends. You heard her testify that they went to the bars together, they spent a lot of time together. In fact, this was the only friend that any of Justin's family really knew about. When the police were asking them, who are his friends, who do we need to talk to, this was the only name they could come up with. Maricel even testified that she had the password to Justin's phone. They were that close. But she felt like he was keeping a secret that night, July 16th. She said that he was worried because this person had been alone in, in Justin's apartment all day, didn't have any food, and didn't have anything to do. Didn't have any food, and so she was, and so Justin was worried about that. That's what Maricela told you. But then Justin decided to stay there at Maricela's house and spend about two hours there at least and have dinner with Maricela while he was worried about this person who was at his apartment. There's only one reason Justin didn't go home. There's only one reason Justin stayed with Maricela and ate dinner, and that's because he knew he was keeping a secret from a person and he wanted to minimize how much time they spent together. He didn't want to go back to that apartment because the more time they spent together, the more chance Mr. Andrade would have to figure out who Justin really was. There's this video from the um, liquor store from that evening as well that shows the car drive up um, and someone get out and go in and, and buy some bottles of beer. Tre Trevor Anderson testified that the timestamp, when he went to the video store or the liquor store and checked the video, he testified the timestamp was off by an hour. We don't know how much the timestamp was off on the day that that video was actually collected. It was off by an hour the day Trevor Anderson went over there. We don't know how much it was off that day. But we know, again, that Justin and Alan Andrade were not together that night until at least 8.55 p.m. Because there was a text, the last text message between the two of them was at 8.55 p.m. <clears throat> It was late that night when he, when Justin went back to the apartment because he didn't want to spend time there. You heard from Justin's family. And a number of them have told you that he that you could tell that uh, Miranda, Miriam Morales testified that you could tell right away by the way that Justin walked um, that he was a man, but she never told the police that. 
she has an obvious bias. This was a friend of hers, and she had never told the police that before. In fact, she told you that Justin's name was Jason. That's what she thought. She didn't even know, but she said she knew he was a man. You've heard from a number of family members about how somebody should have, would have known that Justin was a man, but you have to view their evidence with with thinking of what they have, their biases. Obviously, they're upset. They've lost a family member. Nobody blames them for that. Nobody's saying they shouldn't be. But you have to set that aside and look at the evidence and determine what Mr. Andrade is guilty of. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about what the, the choices you have are. Um, first degree murder has not been proven at all beyond a reasonable doubt. There's just no evidence of it. Second degree murder is that the defendant in the state of Colorado at or about the date and place charged knowingly caused the death of another person. A person acts knowingly with respect to conduct or to a circumstance when he's aware that his conduct is of such a nature or that such circumstance exists. There's no evidence here that Mr. Andrade acted knowingly. This was an immediate reaction. He didn't have time to think about anything. He didn't have time to gather any of his thoughts. He just reacted. This is from one of his phone calls. I mean, I never knew what I would do to tell you the truth. I never even thought about it, you know. I never knew that I had that kind of capability or that or that I had that kind of rage or that kind of, you know. I knew I was a mad person, you know. I knew I could get angry, but I never knew to what extent how. How I can just react like that, you know. But now I know. I never knew. Meaning he never knew before this. Again, this isn't a situation somebody plans for. This isn't something that people think about might happen and make a plan. This isn't a situation where somebody knows how they're going to react. He didn't walk around the apartment when he found out looking for a weapon to use and then react in that way. He acted immediately. Mr. Miller, in his closing state, closing argument, stated that he walked around and got the uh, fire extinguisher. You've heard testimony about how small this apartment was. The entire apartment was 400 square feet about. You saw Justin's body laid on the floor right next to the wall where the fire extinguisher was. That's the first thing that was there. There were also things on the table. He didn't plan to do this. He didn't act knowingly either. He didn't grab something knowing I'm going to, I'm going to, kill this person. He just reacted. There's no evidence that he acted knowingly. The district attorney talked some about the heat of passion instruction. And I'm going to talk about that a little more too. Um, Like he said, you don't even get to the heat of passion instruction unless you find Mr. Andrade guilty of second degree murder. If you decide he's not guilty of first degree murder and then you move to second and you decide that he is guilty of second degree murder, then you consider this heat of passion instruction, which is instruction number 17. And I wanna talk about this for a few minutes. The prosecution, if you get to this point, the prosecution has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Andrade did not act upon a sudden heat of passion. That doesn't mean that there had to be some passion between Mr. Andrade and Mr. Zapata, that there had to be some romantic passion. That's not what the word passion means in this instruction. It doesn't mean that there has to be a fight or a screaming or some kind of passionate exchange between the two people. What it means is that Mr. Andrade was acting, acted and caused the death upon a sudden heat of passion. And the sudden heat of passion was caused by a serious and highly provoking act of the intended victim. And the intended victim's act of provocation was sufficient to excite an irresistible passion in a reasonable person. And between the provocation and the killing, there was insufficient interval of time for the voice of reason and humanity to be heard. They have 
to prove to you beyond a reasonable doubt that that is not what happened. And they haven't done that either. Mr. Andrade reacted to a situation that he was in. They want you to think that a reasonable person would have left Justin's apartment, but that's what this instruction is for. There's a heat of passion. This is something you get to consider, and you, get, you have to decide whether the district, district attorney has disproven it beyond a reasonable doubt. The next, the next crime that you get to consider is manslaughter. And this states that the defendant in the state of Colorado, at or about the date and place charged, recklessly caused the death of another person. A person acts recklessly where he consciously disregards a substantial and unjustifiable risk that a result will occur or that a circumstance exists. Here there's evidence to support this, this charge. Allen just reacted. He didn't make any decisions. He didn't decide to do this. He didn't do anything consciously. Go back to where his phone calls, where you've heard him say over and over that it happened so hard, it happened so fast, I couldn't control it. The fire extinguisher was right there on the wall. That was the first thing that was available. And the last, the last charge that you get to consider is criminally negligent homicide. What this means is that the defendant in the state of Colorado, Colorado at or about the date and place charged, cause the death of another person by criminal negligence. A person acts with criminal negligence when, through a gross deviation from the standard of care that a reasonable person would exercise, he fails to perceive a substantial and unjustifiable ri risk that a result will occur or that a circumstance exists. He fails to perceive. That's what happened here. Mr. Andrade was placed in a situation where he didn't have time. He didn't have the chance to think about what was happening. He just grabbed for something, and he hit Justin Zapata. He failed to perceive any risk because he didn't have the ability to perceive anything about what was going on around him at that time. Felicia Mendoza in the phone call was asking him what went wrong with their relationship. He says, that one moment, that one moment was so bad that I can't explain it. I don't even know what happened. I just, I mean, I know what happened, but I don't know how or why or how I reacted that way. That one thing right there was just, it was something that was uncontrollable. I can't explain it. I was outside of myself. I wasn't even acting as a coherent person. Afterward, yeah. You know, afterward I was in shock and I didn't know what to do, but during and all that, I was outside. I didn't know what was happening. It was over before I even knew it started. It wasn't a conscious decision I made to do that, you know. I didn't sit here and say, I'm just going to do this. It didn't happen like that. It just happened. I can't explain it. Nothing like that has ever happened to me in my whole entire life. When I was talking to you, I started trying to meet people, and I met this person, this female. Well, I thought it was a female, and then I found out on a meeting that it wasn't, and I snapped. Felicia on the phone was making a comment about why would you go home with some girl who just took you home on the first night. Um, and he said, but you wouldn't, you would think it's just, uh, she's just a hoe or something. You would think that, right? You wouldn't think nothing like that though. Never in nobody's mind would something like that ever cross. Never, at least not in my mind. Never, never did it even get close to that vicinity of that happening. Not even close, not even one little bitty, bitty bit would I think it would end up like that. The district attorney wants you to believe that Mr. Andrade got this defense thing from his interrogation with Detective Tharp, that Detective Tharp somehow um, gave him these ideas. Don't you think he'd do a little bit better job 
all he keeps saying in these phone calls is how shocked he was, how he didn't know he had that kind of rage. He didn't know what happened. It was over before it started. If Mr. Andrade was really trying to set up some kind of defense for himself, wouldn't he have talked about the sexual act that happened? Wouldn't he have told Felicia about that if he really, that was his goal? Mr. Andrade left the apartment that night in the car that belonged to the person or that he thought belonged to the person that had just died. And he kept driving it around for about two weeks until he was arrested, a little over two weeks. He didn't change the license plates. He didn't do anything to try to run from this. You heard both Angie Tyree and Felicia Mendoza tell him, why wouldn't you say anything? We would have helped you skip town. We would have given you money. And he said, I didn't want it like that. I didn't want to do that. He said, I knew at some point I was going to have to face it. Felicia asked him, why were you, what were you fucking thinking, Alan, driving that fucking car? What were you thinking? Alan's response, I wanted to face it. I mean, that's, I think that's the only thing I could think of. I just wanted to face it in time, you know? <clears throat> He also spent time with Felicia Mendoza, as you heard, talking about their future. And what you heard him explain is that he wanted to just spend their last days together. He knew this was going to end. He knew he was going to get arrested. He knew he had done something wrong. He wasn't running. He wasn't even trying to hide. He sat in the car that he took playing music loud enough for someone to call the police on him. That's how he got arrested. Those aren't the actions of a man who was planning something and deliberating about it and trying then to get away with it. <clears throat> JJ testified yesterday that Mr. Andrade, um, or that Mr. Zapata looked like a female, acted like a female, talked like a female, walked like a female. Everything about him was like a female. J JJ's wife was angry when J um, JJ first moved in with Alan, or Justin, because his wife believed that JJ was moving in with another woman. He had to do a double take when he found out, when somebody told him that Justin was in fact a man. JJ was actually a friend of, of Justin's. He was a roommate. But he came up here and told you, you couldn't tell that Justin was a man. The only people who told you that you could tell were Justin's family and friends. And again, nobody blames them for trying to protect their brother. They lost a family member. They're sad. They're upset. That's understandable. Nobody blames them for doing that. But you have an instruction on credibility and what testimony you want to believe and that you get to decide whose testimony to believe. <clears throat> And that's one of the things you need to consider when determining what to believe about their testimony. Are they really able to put aside their bias? Monica testified that he was their prettiest sister. Um, she also told you that there were straight guys after him, that she had to repeatedly warn him, that she warned him every single day that he left the house, that he needed to be careful, and that he needed to tell these straight men who he really was because they didn't know. And that you needed, they, that you would look at Justin and you wouldn't be able to tell. She tried to keep track of him, she said, but she started keeping too good a track of him, is what she said. And Justin moved out. He moved out because he was keeping these secrets and he knew she wouldn't approve. And he was doing things that he, <clears throat> he knew she wouldn't approve of. The neighbors, the three men who testified last Thursday afternoon um, <clears throat> in this case, they didn't know Angie or Justin at all. They just assumed that Angie was Angie and that she was a female. They saw her walking in and out of the house and just assumed that she was a female. They had no idea who he really was. Um, Marticella Meza testified about going to Buchanan's and El Sol bars. The district attorney told you that that was for the gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender night, which she testified Buchanan's does have a gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender night, and maybe they went some of those nights. But Marty Salazar, 
Marty Salameza's testimony was that they went to the bars frequently and that they also went to El Sol. There's no GLBT night at El Sol. That was only some of the times. She didn't tell you that the only men who were um, interested in Justin were gay or bisexual or transgender men. And that brings me to another point. The district attorney is, um, in their case, has brought up this information about how Mr. Andrade visited the bisexual site um, or chat room on MoCo space, that Felicia Mendoza had seen that. That is an evidence that Mr. Andrade is bisexual or some, or gay or something else that they're trying to argue. Bisexual females are females who are interested in men and women. It's perfectly plausible that Mr. Andrade was there to meet women. Felicia Mendoza told you that Mr. Andrade's not bisexual. He's a straight, heterosexual male. And there's no evidence that he was bisexual or was looking for any um, men. There's also no evidence that Justin Zapata ever identified himself as bisexual or would have on a MoCo space site. Justin Zapata identified himself as a female and was attracted to males. That's the testimony that you've heard. So Justin Zapata is not a bisexual male. The other part of their argument that doesn't make sense is they want you to believe that Alan was perhaps on this bisexual site or chat room to meet someone, and then maybe because he himself is has confusion or something, but then he wanted to kill a homosexual man, that doesn't make any sense. Mr. Andrade is a straight, heterosexual male who found out that the woman he was with was not a male. He was a woman, or a man. They're arguing a lot about what um, Mr. Andrade did in cleaning up the apartment, deleting the Smoko Space site. Again, what you need to decide is what was in his head at the time these things happened. At the time that these crimes were committed, Mr. Andrade was not doing anything with intent and after deliberation. And he was not committing a bias-motivated crime either. And instruction number Instruction number 18 lays out the elements of a bias-motivated crime. And this is its own crime. This is a separate charge. It's not associated with the murder charge. This is its own charge that you need to consider independently of everything else. And what they have to prove is that in Colorado, Mr. Andrade, with the intent to intimidate or harass Justin Zapata because of his actual or perceived sexual orientation, knowingly caused bodily injury to Justin Zapata. Number one, they haven't proven intent to intimidate or harass him because of his sexual orientation. What happened here had nothing to do with what Justin's actual sexual orientation was or his transgender status. It has to do with how Mr. Andrade was deceived by that the lie that Justin Zapata told to Mr. Andrade. He reacted because of the lie, because of the deceit, not, with, not because of his transgender status. They also have to prove that he knowingly caused the bodily injury. And we've already talked about knowingly and how nothing that happened here was knowingly. Mr. Andrade reacted to a situation that he was placed in and didn't ever plan on being placed in. This crime is not committed because of Justin Zapata's transgender status. It's because Justin Zapata lied and Mr. Andrade was deceived. He is not guilty of a bias-motivated crime. <clears throat> Finally, I want to talk just briefly again about the jail phone calls. You've heard Mr. Andrade's statements in those jail phone calls. You've heard the context under which they were made. And like I said when I started, you may disagree with some of the things that he said. Some of the things he said were in poor taste. But he was sitting in jail for a crime that he knew he didn't commit. And he made some statements in poor taste. Felicia Mendoza talked about this statement about the pink shirt and how she was always trying to get him to wear a pink shirt. They were laughing and joking. That was sort of an inside joke between them. Was it in poor taste? Was it a, a smart thing to say? No. 
but it doesn't mean he committed these crimes. It doesn't mean that that's what was in his head when these things were happening. You heard Felicia Mendoza say that up until this happened, she had never heard him make a derogatory statement about anybody homosexual or transgendered or anything else. She had never heard that. He's sitting in jail for a crime that he didn't commit, and he made some, some statements that were trying to keep the situation lighthearted with Felicia because she was so distraught and she was so upset. But that does not make him guilty of first-degree murder. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Miller talked some about how in these phone calls, Mr. Andrade never says that he didn't do it. Well, you've never heard us say that he didn't do this. You've never heard us say that he didn't do something wrong. It's your job to decide what he did wrong, though. And it wasn't first-degree murder. Mr. Andrade, Mr. Miller talked about how Mr. Andrade referred to Justin in the phone calls as it. This is a confusing case. There was a lot of confusion, even in this trial, about how to refer to Justin Zapata. Someone under a lot of stress, someone in this situation, may say things that they wouldn't normally say or that they might not say later. <clears throat> Mr. Andrade reacted immediately to a situation he was in, to a deception that he was faced with. He didn't have time to act with intent. He didn't have time to deliberate. He didn't have, to act, he didn't have time to act knowingly. He failed to perceive a substantial and unjustifiable risk of the situation he was placed in. And that is the only thing that, the only thing that was going through his head. Mr. Andrade was deceived. He reacted immediately, but he did not commit the crime of first degree murder. He did not commit a bias motivated crime. And I'm asking you to find him not guilty of those things. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miller. You may present your rebuttal closing. Ladies and gentlemen, defense counsel is right. There is no confusion here. And there's no confusion about what the evidence tells us. And I'm talking about the physical evidence, the cell phone calls, the witness statements, the DNA, and everything. When it adds up, it adds up to first degree murder. The defense counsel talks about the only evidence we have of what happened at the apartment that night is the defendant's own statements. After he's fed a number of, I guess as Detective Tharp said at Lifelines, uh, during an interview. <clears throat> that is the only evidence we have because he took the rest of it. That is the only evidence that we have because there was something on the cell phone that Maricela said had a lock on it so no one else could look at it but the victim. He took that phone. There is no confusion here about who killed Angie Zapata. And there is no confusion about what his intent was that day. And these crimes of criminally negligent homicide, manslaughter, and the lesser charges do not fit this crime. Criminally negligent homicide is such a low standard, it does not fall under this crime. Negligence. Negligence means an accident. Manslaughter, you, you've seen the state of mind for that. That's reckless. It's a lot more sinister than reckless to swing a fire extinguisher against someone's head numerous times. And I submit to you that uh, the coroner only, only could say there was more than one because of, so, because of the amount of damage. You saw the okay, picture of this. Sure facts, not evidence. The jury is to consider the evidence as they believe um, they were heard in court. You're welcome to continue, Mr. Miller. You saw the picture of the victim's skull that De Detective Buckingham took a picture of, that it was concave. There were cuts over the eyes. There was a bruise behind the back of her head. No injuries anywhere else. That's not reckless, that's intent to commit murder. We've talked a lot about the jail uh, calls and the primary purpose for us playing those for you was different than the defense. Our purpose, our purpose was to show you a window into his mind about what he thought about transgendered and homosexual individuals. The defense is, is baiting, basing that as the truth to everything that happened. But compare, compare the defendant's discussions with Felicia and Angie about his job, or lack thereof, about where he had been, who he'd gone to movies with. There's a lot of inconsistencies there, and, and 
clearly Felicia Mendoza didn't even know where he was working or if he had a job or didn't have a job. The defendant, the defense, right off the bat, in their closing statement, accused Angie of deception for being who she was, and she was deceiving a lot of people. I'm not sure who she deceived. She went to the liquor store to get cigarettes, is what the liquor store owner said. I haven't heard testimony of her deceiving anyone else in this whole case. Not one person. In fact, the evidence is quite the opposite. The evidence, uh, the evidence is clear. There hasn't been anyone that said Angie wasn't straight up with this. Is she supposed to wear a sign that says I'm transgendered? I mean, so she met JJ, her future roommate, and didn't say, hey, I'm transgendered, right, as they shook hands. I don't think that's required. Think about deception in terms of the conversation uh, the defendant's having with his different girlfriends. Uh, think about why he couldn't leave here because he's with someone else, not with his girlfriends. Ladies and gentlemen, we talked a lot about circumstantial evidence because these items were taken from the crime scene. We talked about being able to infer things from what the evidence shows you. And the evidence is clear that this man committed first degree murder. That evidence is clear. And I didn't say in, in my closing argument that he, he got up and walked around the room and picked up a fire extinguisher. What I said was that you can find that it is after deliberation from him taking those few steps over to the bracket to get the fire extinguisher off of the bracket. Unless he magically had it in his hand, he didn't use his hands to, to get out of the situation he was in. He turned and took the actions to get the fire extinguisher and murder the victim. The defense talked a lot about heat of passion as well. And again, this brings me back, I don't see their instruction, I think I had it up there, but that is a reasonable person standard. And I, I know I keep saying this, but it, were his actions reasonable? Is this a reasonable man? What would a reasonable person do in this situation? Is it reasonable to grab a fire extinguisher and hit a victim time after time crushing in their skull? Is that reasonable? That is exactly why this is not heat of passion. That is exactly why this is not manslaughter or criminally negligent homicide. Uh, defense counsel, and I'll just make a few more points. I know we've talked at length here, but the defense counsel says the only reason, the only reason for uh, the victim to stay at Marcella's house those extra few hours uh, was because she didn't want to go home and have the defendant find out who she was. Could it be because she told her a court that told the defendant the court a day before uh, that she was a male and they were having issues, which is reflected in the cell phone calls? That's what the circumstantial evidence tells you. Could that be why? Could it be because there is no relationship between the two of them and he, he is a roommate? That's what the call records suggest. That's not the, on the only explanation that the defense gave is not the only one, and it's not the logical one, in fact. <clears throat> and again, the argument I made to you was there's no evidence of sexual contact at the time of the murder, which would cause a snap judgment. There was no mixture in the victim's mouth, DNA. There was no hair fibers from the defendant. There was no evidence of that. I brought Missy Woods up here to tell you there was nothing found on the victim. There is evidence of earlier sexual activity. And I would point out to you, um, as defense counsel pointed out, uh, that, that you know the, we aren't saying that the victim didn't look like a female. We're saying everything taken together, the fact that the victim hasn't not told anyone she is in fact a biological male, the fact that her voice sounds like a male trying to talk like a female, the fact that they were roommates for so long, the fact that they went to court together, all that adds up to the defendant knowing well before this crime happened that the victim was transgender. And he had no way home. He had no way home. Defense counsel painstakingly made sure to call Angie Justin throughout the course of the trial and use male pronouns. 
We never were trying to say she wasn't transgender, but that's what she wanted to go by. And a little bit more about the vibrator and the cigarette butt, which was found on the window seal right next to the vibrator. With the DNA from the defendant all over it and not a mixture. Based on the testimony of Sarah Lewis, there is no way the vibrator went where her testimony made it sound like it went without the defendant's consent. No way. That's on a window seal right next to the cigarette butt. And there is no way the defendant did not know that Angie was biological male. The defense suggested, yeah, he went to court with her, but how do we know out of the hundreds of cases whether the defendant got fed up um, and left the courtroom, um, didn't want to wait around while her case was being called up? Angie Zapata was an 18-year-old girl who had gone through several years of living life as a female. Her sisters told her to always be safe. Someone might not accept you. Be careful, for who, be, be careful because someone might hurt you for who you are. Angie Zapata had been to court on numerous occasions for her traffic ticket because she hadn't paid the fines. Angie Zapata's case had been called up as Justin Zapata numerous times before. Angie was acutely aware of when her name was going to be used. Would she sit there and not tell the defendant at some point before going to court and risk being outed in the middle of court? How would she know if the defendant was going to, in fact, be there with him? Ladies and gentlemen, the evidence is clear. The evidence, the evidence, not the defendant's statements, the evidence. The defendant's statements show what his intent was as far as how he felt about transgender people how he felt about someone that lived alternative lifestyles, or someone that was homosexual, or someone that didn't live the same life he did, how he felt about that person. That's what the phone calls tell you. The use of the fire extinguisher, hitting someone numerous times in the head is not reckless. It's not negligence. It's not heat of passion in this case. It is intent to kill, and intent to kill Angie Zapata. And I'm going to ask you to find him guilty of first degree murder because all of the evidence taken together shows that this is clearly done after deliberation. And I want to remind you of one more thing. Speculative doubt does not equal reasonable doubt. Reasonable doubt is any, a doubt based, not based on speculation. Everything the defense has asked you to do is speculate. What I'm asking you to do is follow the evidence in this case. The defendant's guilty of first degree murder, of a bias motivated crime, and the other charges in this case. Find him guilty. Thank you. <clears throat> Instruction 24. The bailiff will now escort you to the jury room. Upon reaching the jury room, you are to select one of your members to be the foreperson of the jury. Your foreperson will preside over your deliberations and shall sign whatever verdicts you reach. The verdicts must represent the considered judgment of each juror. In order to return a verdict, it is necessary that each juror agree to it. Your verdicts must be unanimous. Only one verdict shall be returned signed for each count, and it and the unsigned verdicts and these instructions shall remain in the possession of your foreperson until such time as they are called for in open court. Upon reaching a verdict, you will inform the bailiff of this court, who in turn will notify the court, and you will remain in your jury room until called into the courtroom. You will be provided with a verdict form for each count charge. When you have unanimously agreed upon your verdicts, you will select the verdict option which reflects your verdict. The four person will sign it as the court has just stated. All verdicts form shall be returned after your four person has signed indicating your verdicts. The forms of verdicts you will receive read as follows. I'm the only one who has the verdict forms. They have no copies have been made. And so they read as follows. With regard to count number one, first degree murder, dispensing with the caption, there's a Roman numeral one. We, the jury, find the defendant, Dallin Andrade, not guilty of first degree murder and the lesser included offenses of second degree murder, manslaughter, and criminally negligent homicide with the location for the four person to sign. And Roman numeral two indicates we, the jury, find the defendant, Dallin Andrade, guilty of, and there's four selections, which are the four lesser included offenses, excuse me, 
there's first degree murder and the three lesser included offenses, second degree murder, manslaughter and criminally negligent homicide with a location for the four person to sign. There's a note that indicates the four person may sign only one of the above, Roman numeral one or two. If the verdict is not guilty, then one above should be signed. If the verdict is guilty, then two above should be signed. There's an additional note that indicates if you find the defendant guilty of the crime charged or one of the lesser included offenses, the four person should state this guilty verdict by placing in ink an X in the appropriate square. Only one square may be filled in with the remainder to remain unmarked. There's a second page to this verdict form, which we as attorneys call a special interrogatory form. And it reads as follows. If you find the defendant guilty, Alan Andrade, not guilty of second degree murder, you should disregard this instruction. If, however, you find the defendant, Alan Andrade, guilty of second degree murder, then answer the following question. Your decision must be unanimous. One, was Alan Andrade acting upon sudden heat of passion as defined in instruction number 17? There's a location to mark off for yes or no and a location for the four person to sign. Does that make sense to everybody? With regard to count two, bias motivated crime, count three, aggravated motor vehicle theft in the first degree, and count four, identity theft, count number four. These are pretty much very similar verdict forms. Uh, they indicate in the caption which crime we're discussing, and then it says, we the jury find the defendant, Alan Andrade, not guilty of that given crime, with a location for the four person to sign, and Roman numeral two says, we the jury find the defendant, Alan Andrade, guilty of that particular crime, with a location for the four person to sign. There's a note on each verdict form that states the four person may sign only one of the above, one or two. If the verdict is not guilty, then one above should be signed. If the verdict is guilty, then two above should be signed. Does that make sense to everybody? And if we uh, can have the bailiff come forward. Before I swear in Ms. Elkins as your bailiff in this case, uh, let me address the issue of alternate jurors. It is now time for the court to advise the jury panel who the alternate jurors are. I want to remind you that the alternate jurors were selected in privacy uh, between the lawyers and I a few weeks before the trial started. And it's not a reflection on the individual uh, to be an appropriate juror. As you know, there are two alternate jurors. Juror number six and juror number 13 were selected to be the alternate jurors. And for the record, Juror number six was originally juror 120, and juror number 13 was originally juror 320. Uh, therefore, you are now excused from deliberations. However, you are not discharged from your juror service. If during jury deliberation, the need arises for you to fill in for one of your fellow jurors, you may be asked to join the deliberations. Therefore, it is critical that you must not discuss your testimony with anybody whether it's the media or any third person or even the attorneys. Um, or you may not do any independent research about the case on your own. Uh, you are also ordered not to read any publicity regarding this case or any type of media, any type of format of any media. You um, can leave your phone number or contact information with Ms. Elkins um, out of respect for you since you've dedicated um, much of your time to be here, uh, when we have verdicts, we will contact you immediately and ask you if you want to be present for the reading of the verdict. And if you do, we won't start without you as long as you're within a reasonable distance from the courthouse, 20 minutes or so, if that's possible. If it's not, let Ms. Elkins know and I'll give you more time. Um, if you do not want to be present, we will contact you and let you know that you are relieved of your duties as a juror in this case and are discharged. And at that point, you would have the ability to talk to anybody you want if you chose. Uh, if anybody persisted to speak to you and you didn't want to speak to them, I would encourage you to contact me immediately and I will take care of that issue. Uh, of course, um, it really is your decision whether you want to be present or not, so please let Ms. Elkins know by giving her a cell phone number or some way to contact you immediately, okay? So if you wouldn't mind at this point stepping down from the jury box. 
And so do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalties of law that you will, to the utmost of your ability, keep this jury in some private and convenient place, that you will promptly direct all inquiries or questions that the jury may have to the court, and that you will return with them into court when they have agreed upon a verdict? Thank you. We're going to be in recess pending deliberations of the jury. We're going to give you all of the exhibits as well as the original verdict forms and jury instructions. And if everybody can please rise for the jury as you're entering the jury room. So it's 2.55 on April 22nd. And we're outside the presence of the jury. The parties are present. The defendant appears in plain clothes. We were told that there is a verdict. We were also told that the two alternate jurors wanted to appear by telephone. And so we're going to use two different telephones and put them on speakerphone. Ms. Elkins is getting juror number 13 on speakerphone. Juror number 13, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. And I'm going to get juror number 6 on the phone. Hello, is this juror number six? Yes, sir, it is. This is Judge Kupkow. You're on speakerphone, and we're just going to get started, okay? Yes, sir. Uh, before we bring the jury in, let me make a couple of comments. First, I appreciate everybody being here today. You're, of course, all welcome to be here. Uh, in the last several days, you've all acted very, very appropriately, uh, given the high emotions in this case, and that's lay people, media, everybody has done a great job. Uh, let me make a further comment that um, I expect that you continue to act uh, appropriately during the reading of the verdict. This is an emotional case, as you know, and some of you uh, may have uh, an emotional outburst. Things like yelling and screaming or acting inappropriately in the courtroom is not going to be tolerated. If you think that this case is so emotional for you, that you cannot contain your strong emotions. This is a good time to leave the court. Um, again, you're all welcome to be here. If there's going to be any inappropriate conduct in the court during the reading of the verdict or soon thereafter in the court, there's going to be consequences. So please don't put yourself in that position, OK? Again, you're all welcome to be here, and we appreciate that you're all here. Veronica, let's bring the jury in. If everybody can please rise. Good afternoon. You're welcome to be seated. See, we are on the record in the presence of the jury. Uh, good afternoon. For your information, juror number 6 and 13 are appearing by speakerphone. Are you still there? Yes, sir. Juror number 13, are you still there? Okay. And it's my understanding that a verdict was reached as to each count. Who was selected to be the jury four person? And you are juror number 9? Yes. And has the jury... Um, made a unanimous decision as to each count. Yeah. And if you can please hand the verdict forms and the original instructions to Ms. Elkins. Andrade, if you can please rise with your attorneys. And dispensing with the caption, the verdict reads, with regard to count number one, with regard to first degree murder, we the jury find the defendant, Alan Andrade, guilty of first degree murder. The, the heat of passion in, uh, interrogatory is correctly not filled out based on the verdict. With regard to count number two, bias-motivated crime, dispensing with the caption, the verdict reads as follows. We, the jury, find the defendant, Alan Andrade, guilty of bias-motivated crime. With regard to count number three, dispensing with the caption, the verdict reads as follows. With regard to aggravated motor vehicle theft in the first degree, we, the jury, find the defendant, Alan Andrade, guilty of aggravated motor vehicle theft in the first degree. 
And with regard to count number four, dispensing with the caption regarding identity theft, we, the jury, find the defendant, Alan Andrade, guilty of identity theft. You're welcome to be seated. Ms. Condelius, would you like me to poll the jury? What that means is I'm going to ask each of you if all of these verdicts are your individual verdicts. So I'm going to go one by one, okay? And so juror number one, are these your verdicts? Yes. Juror number two, are these your verdicts? Yes. Juror number three, are these your verdicts? Yes. Juror number four, are these your verdicts? Yes. Juror number five, are these your verdicts? Yes. Juror number seven, are these your verdicts? Yes, sir. Juror number eight, are these your verdicts? Yes, sir. Juror number nine, are these your verdicts? Yes, sir. Juror number 10, are these your verdicts? Yes. Juror number 11, are these your verdicts? Yes. Juror number 12, are these your verdicts? Yes, sir. And juror number 14, are these your verdicts? Yes, sir. And judgment will enter with regard to uh, the convictions for the four um, guilty verdicts. Um, Mr. Miller, what is your position with regard to um, proceeding to sentencing my intention is to proceed to sentencing within the next hour if unless you are ready right now no, no, we, aren't. we aren't ready right now um and given the nature of what the sentencing will be in this case as far as having a witness testify at that um i would ask the court since this was set to go through this week if we could do it tomorrow maybe um if that's all right with the court just to make sure detective buckingham is ready to testify i haven't talked to him today do you want to are you planning on proceeding with regard to counts five through 10? I am, Your Honor. And I wanted to talk to the victim's family about that as well, uh, more in depth as far as w what the defendant's looking at. And also, if we could put that with his other pending cases uh, from the jail, we gotta talk about all those sort of things. Okay. And so you wanna proceed to a trial before the court with regard to the habitual charges? Yes. Okay. Ms. Candelius, would you be prepared to proceed tomorrow morning? No, sir. Okay. Um, are you ready to proceed to immediate sentencing with regard to count number one today, given the fact that the sentence is non-discretionary, it's life without parole? And then we can bifurcate the remaining charges if necessary. We could proceed on that count, Your Honor. I believe um, I would like to meet with the victim's family first to make sure everyone's present that wants to be but I think we can proceed as to that count. And so does four o'clock work for you? For yes. sentencing on count number one? Yes, Your Honor. Ms. Candelius? That's fine. And so we will be in recess until four o'clock with regard to sentencing with regard to count number one. Let me advise the jury uh, that you have now completed, I'm also referring to jurors six and 13, the alternate jurors. You've, you've now completed your duties as jurors in this case and are discharged with the thanks of the court. The question may arise whether you may discuss the case with the attorneys, with the defendant, or other persons, including the media. For your guidance, the court instructs you that whether you talk to anyone is entirely your own decision. It is proper for others to discuss the case with you, and you may talk with them, but you need not. If you talk to them, you may tell them as much or as little as you like about your deliberations or the facts that influenced your decision. If any person persists in discussing the case over your objection or becomes critical of your service either before or after any discussion has begun, please report it to me. Let me also add my own personal comments, and I, I think I speak on behalf of uh, the attorneys in this case at least that um, this was a huge commitment on your part. And what I think separates this country from other countries is our criminal justice system. And I hope you walk away with the feeling like um, this process was fair, it was impartial, and um, that the system works. Without people like you, the system simply falls apart. I realize this was a huge commitment for you on many levels. And I wanna say thank you to you. Um, we do many trials. In fact, we're starting one on Monday. And there's always ways to improve the process. Uh, what I like to do is speak to you, if you wanna to speak to me just for a few minutes in order to get your input about the process, not necessarily the case, to see ways to improve the process. I am also, um, I also imagine that you have questions about security and I've taken care of those issues if you have those issues and there's a plan in place to make sure that you get home safe. 
uh, and so we'll be discussing those issues as well. I also have some certificates to give to you as well as employer information. So if you wouldn't mind going back to the jury deliberation room and I'll be there in just a few minutes, okay? If everybody can please rise for the jury. You're welcome to be seated. Are there any issues before we recess until four o'clock? Not from the people, Your Honor. No, sir. Okay, we'll see you all at four o'clock. People versus Alan Andrade, 08CR 1319. Let's see, the parties are present. And Mr. Miller, did you want to make a record regarding victim rights compliance? Certainly, Your Honor. <clears throat> Your Honor, the victims are present, the victim's family, um, and they have been present throughout the course of the trial. Um, I discussed with them addressing the court today and that um, during the habitual phase, I'll also have a chance to address the court. Um, so we have discussed that and do have one member of the family that does want to address the court today. And then obviously others would address the court after the uh, habitual phase. Okay, so let me explain to everybody in the gallery how I would like um, this sentencing hearing to proceed. We are bifurcating uh, the sentencing hearing. And so we are gonna proceed with regard to count number one now, and then we are going to set the matter for a trial to the court with regard to the habitual offender charges with regard to uh, the other guilty verdicts by the jury. Um, and then we will proceed, if applicable, to a sentencing hearing with regard to counts two, three, and four, as well as the habitual offenses, if I sustain those counts. Uh, I'm going to, with regard to today's sentencing hearing, give the prosecution an opportunity to call witnesses, um, and then I'll give the defense an opportunity to call witnesses, and then I'll allow Mr. Miller to make argument with regard to count number one. I'll give Ms. Candelius or Mr. Morton an opportunity to speak on behalf of Mr. Andrade with regard to count number one. And I'll give Mr. Andrade an opportunity to make a statement to the court if he wishes, he's not required to. Let me also advise those witnesses who may testify that you have an opportunity to communicate with the court in any form that you feel comfortable. Uh, I should tell you that if you take the witness stand, you would be subject to cross-examination by the opposing party. You also have the right to speak at the podium or at the prosecutor's table if you're a prosecution witness. Uh, as long as the deputies feel comfortable where you are, it's fine with me. Does everybody understand? And Mr. Miller, you're welcome to call your first witness. Thank you, Your Honor. And she's going to address the court from the podium. The people would call Maria Zapata. Is that okay with you, Deputy? I can't hear you. I'm sorry. She said it would be better from the witness stand. That's fine. Would you like her to be sworn under oath, Ms. Cornelius? No, Your Honor. Okay. Good afternoon, ma'am. If you wouldn't mind coming to the witness stand, you're welcome to sit down and make yourself comfortable and adjust that microphone if you like. I know that you testified already, but why don't you once again state your name and spell your last name and your relationship to the victim. My name is Maria Zapata, Z-A-P-A-T-A, -A -A, and I'm my baby's mom. Thank you. So this is your opportunity to say whatever is on your mind regarding sentencing in this case regarding count one. I just feel a little thing right now. Doesn't really say everything I want to say, but I want to thank you, Your Honor, for putting up with the, my family, especially my family, for the tears, for the emotions that we share, that we sometimes we're loud. It's just things that we couldn't help because it's been so hard, so hard on my family, on myself. It's been so very, very hard. I lost something, somebody so precious in this heart that a mom feels the hurt of me speaking for me as my mom, as, as a mom. It hurts so bad. I feel so alone. If it wasn't for the rest of my children, I don't know. I just feel so alone sometimes. <laughs> Mr. Dorani, he has the opportunity to have his family talk to, to see him, to write to him. He didn't leave me that opportunity of my baby. 
he took my baby away from me, stuff this selfish act. But the one thing you honor that he can never ever take away is the love and the memories that my, my children will have for my baby, my beautiful, beautiful baby. And I thank you, Your Honor. I thank you for everything. Thank you. If you can begin by stating your name and spelling your last name. My name is Christina, C-R-U-Z. Thank you. And can you tell me what your relationship is with the defendant? He's my brother. Thank you. Thanks for coming to court today. What would you like to say? First of all, I would just like to say that Nobody wanted to be in this position, you know. We've sat on the side of the courtroom too. My brother has a family as well. I'm very sorry, this is a very tragic thing that happened, but it was not something that we signed up for. And my brother is human, and I love my brother. And we're not supporting the outcome, but we do support him as my brother. And we love him very much. And that's all I have to say. Thank you for coming up. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Honor. And I'll keep my statements brief. Obviously, the court has no discretion in this matter. Um, <clears throat> but I would point out that as we, uh, as the detectives invested, investigated this case with Greeley Police Department, they did a great job. And it became more and more apparent, apparent that this was nothing less than first degree murder. And as the evidence unfolded and the court sat through the trial in this case, I think it's quite clear that the evidence brought out showed that Mr. Andrade valued Angie's upon his life less than other lives. And I think it's important that the court make that clear when it gives its sentence today that a life sentence is justice in this case. And Maria Zapata stated it best when she said, you know, he'll still have family members to talk to. And she lost Angie. A life sentence is what justice demands in this case, and that's what I'd ask the court to impose. Thank you. Ms. Condilis? I'll also keep it brief, given the nature of the sentence, but I would, I think that it's important that everybody know that Mr. Andrade um, is not some kind of monster that I think um, has somewhat been portrayed. I've gotten to know Mr. Andrade over the past eight or nine months or so, however long it's been. And he is, um, he is a good person and he does have feelings and he does care about other people a lot. He obviously has a very supportive and caring family. Um, Ms. Cruz was not the only family member present throughout this trial. Um, his other sister, Levina, is here. His mother has flown in from Texas. They've also been present at um, other court hearings and other court dates. And so he does have a lot of people who care about him and I know that he cares about them as well. And um, I would just like everybody to know that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Andrade, you don't have to say anything. Is there anything you would like to say? No. Thank you. Before I impose a sentence, um, let me ask Mr. Miller and Ms. Condelius, how long will the habitual phase take in terms of your evidence? A half hour, an hour, Your Honor. Ms. Condelius? I think that sounds about right. How soon can you be ready? Um, I'm actually out next week, so... Are you available, for example, Friday? Since we already had plans to go through Friday? Well, I'm not prepared to go forward with that okay. part of this case at this point. Okay. Kelly, what's the next available time where we have an hour on our docket to single set it? How's May 8th at 3 o'clock? That's, That's fine with the people, Your Honor. Thank you. Well, the, I'm going to defer many of my thoughts and comments that I would like to make because we still have outstanding charges against Mr. Andrade, and I still need to make findings of facts and conclusions of law with regard to the outstanding uh, guilty verdicts and the habitual offense charges. But I will say, Mr. Andrade, that um, I hope as you're spending the remaining part of your life, your natural life, in the Department of Corrections without the ability to parole, 
that you every day think about the violence and the brutality that you caused on this fellow human being and the pain that you have caused not only your family but the family of Angie Zapata. And so the court is going to impose a life sentence in the Colorado Department of Corrections, that is, that you spend the remaining natural life in the Department of Corrections without the ability to parole. The court also is going to impose a $35 docket fee, a $163 victim compensation and victim assistance fee. The court is going to order that you submit to DNA testing as required by law and pay an associated fee of $128. There's a $5 court security fee, a $25 PD fee, and time payment fee. Let me also comment, I think it's important to comment on um, the professionalism of the attorneys in this case. I think all four attorneys were incredibly professional. I really think you do your profession um, a service by acting the way you did. Let me also comment that everybody in the gallery acted very appropriately, and uh, including the media. And there's been some criticism why I allow the media in the courtroom. And in my experience, um, quite frankly, I, never, I didn't really notice that you were here. And that's uh, exactly what we expect. And so thank you very much for acting professionally. So we are in recess, and we'll see you on May 8th for the habitual phase. Ms. Candelius, if you can calculate credit for time served and give that to me on May 8th, okay? Thank you. Ms. Candelius, if you can calculate credit for time served and give that to me on May 8th, okay? Thank you.